from the mountains to the sea, to every nation on this world. Welcome to Christian Virtual Fellowship, a production of Allegiance to the King. Allegiance to the King is a church that meets online to worship the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and to fellowship with one another. If you, you can find Allegiance to the King at a2kchurch.org and also on Facebook. My name is Ray Scott, and I'm going to share my screen now. Let's see? Okay, can everybody see that? Okay, good. So from faith to faith, Romans 1, 17, we're going to discuss faithfulness of God and our response to God's faithfulness. And that's a picture of a painting of Jesus waving to his disciples after the resurrection near the Sea of Galilee and is preparing dinner and waving for the disciples to come on in and have something to eat. Yahweh our God is a faithful God. Our Lord is faithful and we're gonna take a look at his faithfulness which inspires us to be faithful as well. In Deuteronomy 7, 9, it reads, Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant and his faithfulness to a thousand generations for those who love him and keep his commandments. And then in 1 Peter chapter 4, it reads, Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God are to entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Despite Mankind's rebellion, God has remained faithful to his plan that the earth have human rulers. That's God's plan. He made the earth good. After six, after five days, everything he saw it, and he said, it's all good. And then he made man. And by adding man, he called his creation very good to make sure that humans, well, let me read the passage here from Genesis. And the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife. This is after the, the sin of Adam. And he had to um, look into the matter. And so the Lord God clothed them. And then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us knowing good and evil, and now he might reach out with his hand and take fruit also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out and at the east end of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. So you see, it was God's intention that Adam and Eve be the kings and priests of this world. But due to Adam's sin, that came to an abrupt end and they had to leave the garden. And so as to make sure that the humans didn't sneak back into the garden, God posted a guard to the way to the tree of life so that we could not have eternal life without first being restored to being the kings and priests of his creation. Another example, let's see here, another example 
of how God gave every reason for, let me back up here. Here is another example of how mankind gave every reason for God just to wipe humanity out and start over again with a new Adam and Eve. But instead, God recognized one man, Noah, as righteous and spared the lives of him and his family to start over. In a sense, Noah was a new Adam. Like Adam, Noah was told to be fruitful and multiply. So it says in Genesis 6, then Adam said to Noah, the end of humanity has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of people, and behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. So we know we're all familiar with the story of Noah and the ark and the reason why God had to bring such a drastic solution to the problem of evil in the world. But he didn't give up on humanity being restored. He found one man who, who was qualified before in the eyes of God to continue to live. And he saved that man and his family's life. This is a demonstration of how God has been faithful in keeping his promise that man would one day again be restored as rulers of the earth. Another example of how God certainly could have justifiably ended a covenant is in Exodus, uh, which we'll read. In Exodus 24, Moses read the book of the covenant to the people. They agreed to obey all the terms God had laid out. Then Moses and 73 leaders of the Israelites went up Mount Zion to meet God. They ate there in the presence of God a clear sign of a covenant being established. As the men were leaving the mountain, God told Moses to go back up the mountain to get further instructions about the tabernacle and, and priestly practices God required to be in their camp. Moses was there for 40 days and nights. While he was gone, all chaos broke out in the Israelite camp. And here's a picture of of the golden calf incident which is uh quite notorious what did what did moses find after going down the mountain with god's instructions after 40 days well he found his people well let's just continue to read now when the people saw that moses delayed to come down from the mountain the people assembled around Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people tore off the gold rings, which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. Then he took the gold from their hands and fashioned it with an engraving tool and made it into a cast metal calf. And they said, This is your God, Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. So the Israelites chose to make a golden calf as an idol representing Yahweh, the God who rescued them with a mighty hand from Pharaoh. They violated the commandment not to make graven images of God. What is even more appalling is that Aaron, who had been on Mount Sinai with Moses just 40 days earlier, went completely along with this idolatry. He knew better. So the next day they got up early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and got up to engage in lewd behavior. 
Then the Lord spoke to Moses, go down at once for your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corruptly, have behaved corruptly. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a cast metal calf and have worshiped it and have sacrificed to it and said, this is your God, Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. The Lord tells Moses, go down at once to your people whom you, Moses, brought up from the land of Egypt. Now it's Moses, not God, who brought them out of Egypt. God doesn't want anything to do with these people. Then the Lord said to Moses, I have seen these people and behold, they are an obstinate people. So now leave me alone that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them and I will make you a great nation. So God was clearly fed up with this crowd. Leave me alone that I may destroy them. But notice God doesn't give up on saving humanity. He said, I will make you a great nation, Tell, speaking to Moses. This is similar to what he told Abraham. I will make you the father of many nations. The atrocity by the very people he had just entered into an agreement with did not affect his faithfulness to his plan to rescue mankind and make them kings and priests over his creation. The point is that God is all wise and all knowing. Therefore, his plan of redemption for the entire world is not something that people are able to undermine by their own unfaithfulness or sin. God knows what he is doing, so we can trust him to be a faithful and effective God in redeeming us and setting us up as rulers of this world. So far, I've given three examples of how God could have changed his mind about mankind and just wipe us out or walk away. I would like to give three, some positive examples of how the faithfulness of God is such a blessing to us. The biggest blessing showing how faithful God is, is to his plan of redemption, is his giving us his son, Jesus the Nazarene as our Lord. Full of compassion. When it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and began dining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. Now go and learn what this means. I desire compassion rather than sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus didn't come for those who thought they had it all together. He came for those who knew they had problems and were looking for solutions. Despair can be healed with hope and compassion. Another example of compassion. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness. Seeing the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd. Matthew 9. So if you feel like you are a sheep without a shepherd, Jesus is here to help you. He loved you on the cross, and he has compassion for you now. In Isaiah, hundreds of years before Jesus' birth, he wrote, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord anointed me to bring good news to the humble. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to, proc to proclaim release to captives and freedom to prisoners. Isaiah 61. 
Jesus declared at his at the start of his ministry the same passage. I don't think I need to read it. But Jesus didn't come to be just the king of the Jews. He came to give understanding of the kingdom of God to those who would listen and to set free those who were oppressed. Are you oppressed? Do you feel like a prisoner to sin or circumstances? Jesus is here for you. There are so many things to say about how God's unique son, Jesus, is a sign of God's faithfulness to the plan of redemption. The wisdom of God dwells bodily in Jesus. Imagine that. We struggle to find wisdom for the circumstances we are in. Perhaps we should just look to God who gives such wisdom without upbraiding us. God's faithfulness to his plan of redemption is also shown by what he gives the church. He's, he has given us men and women who dedicate themselves to service. They are called to the ministry. God gives every member of the covenant family a new heart that is capable of loving others and loving God. Through Jesus Christ, God gives us his spirit as a mark that we belong to Christ. Through the scriptures, he gives us hope for a better world, a better tomorrow, even better bodies through the promised resurrection. And he gives us, he gives us one another to love, support, and enjoy. Knowing we trip up, God says, says that since he is by nature faithful and just, he forgives us our sins when we confess them to him. So what should our response to God's faithfulness be? We are to respond with faithfulness ourselves to God. In Romans 1.17, it says, For in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous one will live by faith. From experiencing the faith or faithfulness of God, we should arrive to our being faithful to the one who called us. This is not automatic, as Jesus expressed in the parable of the sower and the seed. And in Luke 8, it reads that the sower went out to sow his seed. This is the parable by Jesus, and I'm sure you're familiar with it. And as he sowed, some fell beside the road, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the sky ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky soil, and when it came up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. And yet other seed fell into good, the good soil and grew up and produced a crop of a hundred times as much. As he said these things, he would call out, the one who has ears to hear, let him hear. When the disciples heard this parable, they asked Jesus to explain. And Jesus gave the explanation. Now, this is the parable. The seed is the word of God, and those beside the road are the ones who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart, so that they will not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky soil are the ones who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And yet these do not have a firm root. They believe for a while, and in a time of temptation, they fall away. And the seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard. And as they go on their, their way, they are choked by worries, riches, and pleasures of this life. And they bring no fruit to maturity. But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word with a good and virtuous heart and hold it firmly and produce fruit with perseverance. And that's what God is looking for, a good reception for his word. 
to hold that gospel firmly and produce fruit with perseverance, not to give up. God has not given up on you, so don't give up on him. How else do we respond to God's faithfulness? It reads in 1 Peter chapter 4, For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those also who have suffered, who suffer according to the will of God, are to entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. So you see a lot of people in the world are persecuted for doing the right thing and speaking the truth, the gospel of God. And, you know, they entrust their souls, their very lives to that faithful creator. Peter says it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. The judgment for those who are faithful has been advanced to the present day. Instead of waiting to be judged in the future, on the day of judgment, members of the covenant family are judged as not guilty. They have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's beloved son. You become blameless in the sight of God. All you need to do is persevere in the faith. Be faithful. Don't back down when someone asks if you're a Christian. Don't deny Jesus Christ as your Lord. Don't look back when you're at the plow. N.T. Wright, the noted scholar and former bishop of the Anglican Church, and who has written many books about the Bible, once wrote, God has been faithful to his purposes and promises. If you want to benefit from this, you must have an answering faithfulness that believing obedience he spoke of in verse 5. So in verse 5, it reads, Romans 1, 5, states in part that Paul received his apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles in behalf of his name. The obedience of, of faithfulness is what is meant. So what is the judgment? Romans 1.17 says the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Starting with the faithfulness of God, as we discussed, we come to our own faithfulness. And there are people today who suffer for their faith in the gospel in China, Iran, North Korea, some Muslim countries, the persecution is severe. They entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. We respond by being faithful in how we deal with temptations to sin. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it reads, Therefore, let the one who thinks he stands watch out that he does not fall. No temptation has overtaken you except something common to mankind. And God is faithful. So he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also. So that you will be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. From I idolatry. So we pick up our cross and follow Jesus by putting to death the deeds of the flesh. In Romans chapter 8, it says, So then, brothers and sisters, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living in, the, in accord with the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who have been led by the Spirit of God, these are sons and daughters of God. For you were called to freedom, it says in Galatians 5. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, 
but serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care, take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. So there are many ways to be faithful, and I'd love to hear from you about them. I would like to speak just a little bit more about believing that God raised Jesus from the dead. My parents passed away more than 20 years ago. I expect them to be blessed as faithful believers. But if they were raised today with glorious and corruptible bodies today, would I act differently? I think so. I think my life would change. So how are our lives, our activities changed by having our Lord Jesus raised from the dead? If there is no change in one's activities, one can conclude that he or she really believes in her heart that, well, let me start this over again. If there is no change in one's activities, can one conclude that he or she really believes in his heart that Jesus is alive today? I don't think so. So our faithfulness is not to be a passive one, but active, living, breathing faithfulness. It is to be just as if a family member had been raised from the dead, because that is what happened. So what are we to do? Well, two things come to mind. Be thankful for the faithfulness of our God to his plan for redeeming us. Praise his holy name. Respond to his faithfulness by being faithful to the teachings of Jesus. That is how we show we love him. So I invite your comments as to how we can be faithful to our Heavenly Father and his wonderful Son, Jesus. And that concludes that teaching. So I'll stop sharing. And so how are we doing? I feel like amen, I've had, I feel like I've had cotton Hallelujah. in my mouth. <laughs> Good teaching, Ray. Thank you so much. I love, well, I love it. I love it. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, the uh, the uh, the from faithfulness to faithfulness, from God's faithful faithfulness to taking care of us, our future to our being faithful to him. I think that uh, that's the whole point of it. So anyway, I'm real blessed to uh, share all that with you. So I'll tell you what, why don't I end the uh, recording? And uh, if this teaching has blessed you, and we have many teachings on this channel. I encourage you to, su to subscribe to Christian Virtual Fellowship and join us on Sundays. And you can contact us through our website, a2kchurch.org, and also through Facebook. Thank you.